Hi, my name is Ethan Messaker, and on this special edition of ECTV, we are diving into the relevant and unfortunate topic of discrimination and how it's affecting our communities today. In recent months, there's been discussion about placing Muslims in camps. This notion bears an uncanny resemblance to Native American reservations, concentration camps in Germany, and Japanese American internment camps. Samaya is in the studio with Kathy Masaoka to discuss Japanese American internment camps, as well as the discrimination that Muslim American people face today and how different organizations are working together to fight the issue. Hello, today I am here with an amazing person, Ms. Kathy Masaoka, who is joining us here in Ventura, all the way from Los Angeles. Thank you for being here with us today. You're welcome. Ms. Masaoka has been active in Little Tokyo and Asian American community politics since the 70s. She is also a member of the LA group that mobilized many Japanese Americans to speak up for redress, and reparations for the World War II incarceration of 110,000 Japanese Americans. Ms. Masaoka's family was incarcerated in these Japanese American camps. Ms. Masaoka, can you please tell me what motivated you to do this type of work and to start these inspiring movements? Well, I didn't start them alone, and I was a part of a larger movement of uh, many young people in our Japanese American community that you know, uh, had grown up not knowing about the camps. Mm -hmm. And I think when we learned about it and we started going to Manzanar, which is one of the camps on a pilgrimage, uh, we, you know, we started to hear things that we hadn't heard before about what that experience was like. Right. And so when the idea of redress came up for Japanese Americans that had been in these camps, uh, we thought that was a really good idea. And one of the organizations that formed was the Nikkei for Civil Rights and Redress, or actually at that time, the National Coalition for Redress and Reparations. And it organized itself with the sole purpose of getting redress and reparations, an apology, mm -hmm. and a 20, uh, at least $20,000 individual reparations for each person that had been incarcerated in the camps. That's amazing. Yeah. So um, I think what inspired me really was the fact that we didn't know our history and this had actually happened in the United States and it had been a violation of the constitutional rights of a whole people, you know, uh, incarcerated because of their race, no trial, mm -hmm. uh, no due process, and none of those uh, rights were part of the whole thing. So I think we realized it was a tremendous wrong that had been committed and our community was really affected by that. People we're not really proud to be Japanese Americans. I didn't grow up being proud to be Japanese American. And not until the Asian American movement did I start to realize I, I did have a history here, we did have a history right. here, contributed to this country, and that this happened to our people and needed to be corrected. Mm -hmm. And um, we don't really hear about the internment camps from a lot of the people who were in the camps. Why do you think that is? Well, I think like myself mm -hmm. and uh, the people that went through the camps, the first generation, the Issei, the second generation, my parents. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was such a traumatic experience, number one. And number two, because they were put into the camp, they were a very small community at that time. You know, not too many, very isolated, didn't get a lot of support except from the Quakers. And so I think um, with that kind of experience, I think they felt very much alone. Okay. And after the camps, they were really told to sort of disperse. They left the West Coast, many of them, mm -hmm. and they ended up in the Midwest, you know, places like Chicago or Cleveland or places back east. And I think the message that they got was, you were put in camps because you were Japanese Americans. Mm -hmm. And somehow it was wrong to be Japanese American. And even though they didn't tell us that as we were growing up, right. that message was communicated. It was sort of, you have to fit in and become like everybody else and don't draw attention to yourself as a Japanese American. And they didn't talk about the camps. When they talked about the camps, they may have said, they may have said camp. And we thought, summer camp? What kind of camp okay. is this? And they always said, what camp were you in? What camp were you in when they talked to people? And not until really in high school, and my sister asked about it, you know, what were these camps? Did, I, did we hear about it? And then my mother would say, oh, it wasn't too bad. 
it wasn't a big deal. Okay. And then not until, again, later when I was after during the, the movement and working in the community, then people started talking about what it was like, and it was like, really? They were, they, they were actually in these places, these 10 different camps in the United States. And so I think the shame of it, mm -hmm. and they didn't want to pass that on to us as children. They wanted us to sort of move on and um, not recall that bad experience. And, so you know. did the camps affect your childhood at all in any other way, or your family life? It didn't ex affect my family life, but I think going to high school, um, when Pearl Harbor was mentioned in, in the classroom, mm -hmm. I just remember feeling very, very um, self-conscious. And somehow I felt I was responsible for Pearl Harbor. And really, <laughs> nobody said anything, but it was just that feeling, because I was one of the few Japanese Americans in that class. and. Uh, I think the, I carried that sense with me that, you know, there was something wrong. You know, but again, that was, Jap I didn't, I couldn't distinguish between Japan and Japanese Americans because we didn't have that idea of being Japanese American at that, that time. Identity. That we didn't have that identity. Mm -hmm. It was either you were Japanese from Japan or you were Hawaiian American. And there was no such thing as a Japanese American, at least when I was in high school, which mm -hmm. is many years ago. You know, so not until the late 60s did we have that idea of like um, Asian American, Japanese American, and fully appreciating our identity. Okay, so as you grew up, that changed? Yeah. The form of, forming of a Japanese American identity changed? Yes. And when we say internment camp, is there another term or another way to phrase that or say it? Yeah, I think internment camp doesn't give the full sense of what it was. Internment. Uh, I mean, technically, actually, there were internment camps, mm -hmm. which were a little bit different than the camps that uh, most of the population was in. My grandfather was actually in an internment camp, which was really a prison, uh, because he was Issei, first generation. He was picked up by the FBI, one of the close to 2,000 um, leaders that were picked up right after Pearl Harbor okay. and put into these internment camps. And they really did not have... Uh, uh, they were put on trial. They were actually questioned and kept there, and nobody knew what was going on. So he was taken away. The other camps that we talk about really were, and I'm going to use this word, concentration mm -hmm. camps, uh, that we use now because that's what the government used, and, and we feel it fits better. They stopped using it after a while because, you know, we don't want to confuse it with the um, death camps right. in Germany or in Europe. but. Really, they technically were concentration camps. So we like to use the word, use the term incarceration. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, or the, our parents were incarcerated in these camps because they were really prisons. Mm -hmm. They had barbed wire around them. They were guarded. So um, these were camps. And internment sometimes sounds like, oh, well, they use the word relocated. You know, like yeah. they relocated them, evacuated. Like there was some kind of emergency, and they were just moved around. Yeah, but there wasn't. No, it wasn't. They were forcibly removed from their homes and put into these camps and taken away. It's terrible. Yeah. It's very terrible. And why do you think that your movement is still important to you and to us today? Well, it's still important because, I mean, I thought after we won redress in 1988, which was an amazing victory for mm -hmm. a small community, and we really won because of the support of all the American people and of the, uh, the government and, you know, in, in D.C. when they voted for redress. But we would not have won if there hadn't been support, you know, wide support and a lot of education that was done. Mm -hmm. So um, that education still needs to be done. People still don't really understand that there were camps and that it was wrong. Because every time something happens now, you know, whether it's um, Paris or 9-11, somebody mm -hmm. brings up the camps. Right. And they seem to forget that it was, the apology was made and the government said they made a mistake and that it was wrong. Because mm -hmm. someone will bring it up and say, well, maybe we should bring those back because it worked for World War II. Well, it didn't work no. for World War II. And they forget. Yeah. And, and there was no, you know, there was no cause and it violated people's rights. So I think continuous education needs to be done still around the camps. And because it's brought up again and again, uh, we need to learn the lessons from that, mm -hmm. which was we need to protect people's rights. 
We need to see people, uh, judge people not on their color of their skin or their religion or their beliefs. Absolutely. You know, but to um, judge people by their actions and, you know, not violate those kinds of things. Yes, I completely agree. And can you tell me what is some of the current work that you're involved in? Well, unfortunately, um, I mean, we, we thought that, you know, after <clears throat> when you reach us that, you know, it was clearly understood by this country, you know, what, um, that this would never happen again. Then mm -hmm. after 9-11, uh, we were, you know, the country was put into sort of, a, again, a, 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 different, a different stage, you know, mm -hmm. where people were more aware of, of what was happening in the world, but of a different, uh, you know, the, the need, to, again, to call upon our understanding of different people in this country. So for us, after 9-11, it was like, wow, this must be how it was for our parents after Pearl Harbor. Hmm. People must be feeling afraid. Yeah. They, you know, there, there could be a danger, again, of people being scapegoated. Mm -hmm. And we as Japanese Americans, because our families went through that experience, because we fought for redress, because we understand what can happen, mm -hmm. we have that responsibility. And one of uh, our members, um, Lillian Nakano, she was a, a Nisei lady, she's passed away, but she spoke at a vigil we had right after 9-11 and said, Japanese Americans have an obligation and a duty to speak up. And that meant a lot to the American Muslims yes. that came that day. Several hundred people came out to this vigil on a very short notice. And to me, that showed that most of our community, many in our community, understood our role and our legacy as Japanese Americans. Mm -hmm. And I was really proud you know, that our community really felt that. Yeah. And so from that point on, we said to ourselves um, in our organization, NCRR, we decided that we needed to understand what Islam was mm -hmm. and to start to get to know each other. And I want to quote um, one of the leaders of the Muslim Public Affairs Council, Dr. Maher Hatut. He said a very simple thing at a program in Little Tokyo. He said, what we need to do is just simply get to know each other build a relationship and get to know each other. And we said, yeah, that's right. We don't even know each other. So we did that. We had a break the fast programs for the first four years where we got together mm -hmm. during Ramadan mm -hmm. and um, had meals together. And we talked about what Islam was to each other, what Buddhism was, uh, we shared different religious beliefs. It's beautiful. Um, yeah. Seriously, it's amazing. And we had different educational programs for our community to understand uh, again, the need for constitutional rights protection, right. what was going on in the Middle East, because we didn't really understand that. Um, so we had these different programs, and that was some of the early work we did right after 9-11. And recently, after Paris and San Bernardino, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it was different. We again had a vigil um, and on December 12th. And it was a different kind of organizing because this time we didn't organize it just within our own community. This time we were able to organize it with the Council on American Islamic Relations, LA chapter, and the Muslim Public Affairs Council, the JACL, ourselves, and an arts group called Tuesday Night Project. Wow. But the beauty of it is that we had a relationship now with the American Muslim community mm -hmm. and so of trust and of the Shura Council. So we came together and we said, Let's do this vigil, and how do you think it should be done? So we planned it together, and again, you know, close to 400 people came out. Wow. And uh, I think, again, showed the understanding that many people have of not only our responsibility, and not just Japanese Americans, because there, there were different ethnicities there. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of understanding had grown since 2001, and I was really actually... Uh, you know, very happy to see that. Yeah. You know, and it gave me hope because there are a lot more organizations involved. We had a solidarity statement that was signed by close to 80 groups uh, very quickly, mm -hmm. stating solidarity with the uh, American Muslim community, the Sikh community, the South Asian community. And, um, you know, it didn't take much effort to get that because people really did have an understanding that's incredible. of its importance. And that coalition is going to continue. So the work that you're doing is absolutely amazing and with all these different corporations or not corporations, organizations, <laughs> organizations 
but how can we as youth and as a community work with you or work in the same way that you are working and the same things that you are doing and help you with what you are doing? You know, uh, our organization, NCR, is very grassroots. You know, all of us, we weren't staff. We didn't mm -hmm. have paid staff. We were simply people that had jobs, like teachers and, mm -hmm. you know, truck drivers and postal workers. And we met on the weekend and in the evening. So I think the work that needs to be done is, like, for er very ordinary people. You don't have to have a job to do this, in, you know, okay. in this particular area. And I think young people can do this, too. And I just wanted to share that. One of the programs that we had, and this could be done on a high school level mm -hmm. or college level, but it was called Bridging Communities. Okay. And it was inspired again by an American Muslim named uh, Shaquille Syed of the Shura Council. Mm -hmm. When they visited Manzanar as a community yeah. and they saw what the camps were like, he said, I wish that there was a way for young people to get to know each other throughout the year. Mm -hmm. So we had this program for American Muslim high school students and Japanese American high school students and they visited each other's communities, had workshops together, they went to Manzanar, they visited the mosque, they visited a Buddhist temple, they learned about their history, they learned about his, you know, the beliefs. And from that, my feeling, it, it changed people because some of the young yeah. people, the Japanese Americans for example, uh, they were well, both sides. but they really felt that they gained a lot from that program and one of them spoke up at a city council meeting in Orange County I think it was Yorba Linda when they had really terrible things going on some of the city council people there or some of the mm -hmm. they had a rally where they were speaking very hateful things against Muslims okay. and they went to they had a city council meeting where they were trying to speak up in support of, uh, of American Muslims mm -hmm. she went and she said, I'm going because my friends are American Muslims and I need to support them. And she wow. was, she, you know, this is because she was part of that program. Right. And another young man that had been part of the program is at UC Riverside. And they did a Day of Remembrance program there commemorating the camps. But he brought in the whole issue of the American Muslims and some of the media um, uh, things that were being said. Mm -hmm. And they showed that and they talked about how they could fight, combat that. So. My feeling really is that this program and building a relationship mm -hmm. again is really important, and that could be done in wherever people are at, you know, at their schools, high school, colleges. Find ways that you could have programs together, okay. events together, and I think Shaquille Syed of the Shura Council again is trying to do things where neighbors just get to know each other, and wow. on an everyday level, you know. So I think those are the kind of things that are important, and. I think going to Manzanar might not be a bad idea, <laughs> you know, because when you see the camps, mm -hmm. it really makes a big difference yeah, in I'm just sure. hearing about it, yeah, you know, because sure. you kind of imagine people being there for three years of their lives. I know. Yeah. So do you have any pictures, anything you would like to show us? I do. Uh, there's pictures here. Okay. And this is some of the early work for the candlelight vigil in 2001 and Lillian speaking. Um, and then these are some of the events and programs that we had with the different uh, communities, including the Arab American and American Muslim community on civil liberties and the Patriot Act when it was passed. Okay. Um, spoken word poet, Dima Hilal. Um, we also had the Day of Remembrance programs where we invited the American Muslim community to come. They mm -hmm. come every year. We have one coming up on February the 20th at the Japanese American National Museum. And um, the focus of that program will again be actually, um, I think the theme is something like, is it 1942 again? And um, kind of warning against the violation of civil liberties, you know, right. and fighting against fear. Yeah. So, um, so we, we always include, and I think po culture and arts mm -hmm. and poetry yes. are all part of who we are and yeah. they express our beliefs. And Absolutely. so, um, yeah, and so those are always part of our programs as well. And um, this is the Buddhist temple where we had our first Break the Fast program. And we, you know, we, we also um, acted as monitors when they were doing the special registration. I don't know if you, probably too young, but yeah, right after 9-11, they were doing the special registration of mainly young men from 13 countries, and most of them happened to be heavily American, Amer Muslim countries. Muslim, yeah. And so a lot of them were getting detained by the then immigration. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. And so they, the organizations asked us, can you be present to witness if anything occurs? So we said yes, not that we were going to do anything, but just to be witness. And witness what's know. happening. Yeah. So we said yes, and we, that's where the yellow shirts were wearing there to help do that. And um, yes, and so we just continued with you know, our, our different events like that. But I'm really proud of the, uh, the Break the Fast, I mean the Bridging Communities Program, mm -hmm. because I think that did a lot. And we started that in about 2008, and it's now going on with the Japanese American Citizens League. They've continued to do that. So um, that's a very great program. Yeah, and it seems I, like it is. And they're working more now with college students, although I think the high school is still important. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, and finally, of course, the vigil. The yes, vigil. Were, very, yeah. Those are very inspiring pictures. They are. This is people holding their, their candlelight. And then we formed a human peace symbol. Yeah, that's which, my favorite. <laughs> yeah, it is. Which is, of course, the main message is that, right. you know, to overcome fear and really to fight against terrorism and what they want, mm -hmm. whatever terrorists want, is really to tear us apart. And so to fight that is to fight it. And we call the coalition Vigilant Love. Oh, that's amazing. That's and, beautiful. The, and vigilant usually means to like be sort of vigilant against attack. Right. But we're trying to be vigilant with our love. And so it's not a, it's not a fearful thing. It's, a, it's more of a positive thing. You know, oh, that's so. beautiful. Thank you so much You're for welcome. all your pictures and for your time and for allowing our community to witness and to better understand the important and still relevant topics that we have covered today. Thank you for being Thank here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Samaya and Ms. Masaoka, for such an eye-opening and much-needed discussion. Zayan Reza, an ECTV member, will now be talking about what it is like to be a Muslim in America. Hello, my name is Zayan. I'm 16 years old, and I'm an American Muslim. I've always thought that being born in America, raised Muslim, and staying true to my cultural roots were something to be proud of, something to cherish, to empower myself with. But as recent events have occurred, I have found it harder and harder to embody myself with my values, traditions, and practices. I, like many of my fellow Americans, my neighbors and my friends, do not understand nor condone any of the brutal attacks that have occurred in the past in the name of Islam. I will always stand by the truth of the matter, and that is that Islam condemns such terror attacks and finds no pleasure in the suffering of humankind, including followers of other religions. Growing up in America, in Southern California, I have been given a priceless privilege. This privilege does not go without gratefulness. I am fully aware of the gift of freedom. In so many ways, I am just a regular kid. I am in high school in Ventura, I love to bake, ride my penny board, and swim at the beach. I am incredibly blessed to have the life that I have, and I will not waste a minute in foregoing efforts to stand up for others who are oppressed, who are voiceless in our world. That is the kind of American Muslim I am. That is the type of human I am. I find refuge in poetry and spoken word. Words give me an outlet to speak out, to empower myself and society. I cherish my education, teachers, counselors, friends, and family. Every bit of knowledge I come across becomes a platform for my next aspiration. I wish to serve the world, to lead, heal, and encourage. I want to become a pediatrician and conduct research in a lab to someday develop cures for childhood cancer. I want to become a voice for the helpless, a support for the needy, an educator for the ignorant. Our world is huge and wonderful, and I envision a future where young leaders aspire to and become people who lead generations and move mountains and lend helping hands. A compassionate, dutiful generation who do not see skin color, religion, or gender as a roadblock to success. That is the kind of American Muslim I am. We hope you have gained a new perspective on this sadly relevant issue. That is what ECTV is all about to inform, impact, and make a difference both locally and globally. Thank you.